Um, the reading today is taken from Daniel, chapter 1, starting right at the very beginning. <coughs> Daniel's training in Babylon. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord delivered Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand, along with some of the articles from the temple of God. These he carried off to the temple of God in Babylonia and put in the treasure house of his God. Then the king ordered Ashpenaz, chief of his court officials, to bring into the king's service some of the Israelites from the royal family and the nobility, young men without any physical defect, handsome, showing aptitude for every kind of learning, well-informed, quick to understand, and qualified to serve in the king's palace. He was to teach them the language and literature of the Babylonians. The king assigned them a daily amount of food and wine from the king's table. They were to be trained for three years, and after that they were to enter the king's service. Among those were chosen were some from Judah, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. The chief official gave them new names. To Daniel, the name Belteshazzar. To Hananiah, Shadrach. To Mishael, Meshach. And to Azariah, Abednego. But Daniel resolved not to defile himself with the royal food and wine. And he asked the chief official for permission not to defile himself in this way. Now God had caused the official to show favor and compassion to Daniel. But the official told Daniel, I am afraid of the Lord my king who has assigned your food and drink. Why should he see you looking worse than any of the other young men of your age? The king would then have my head because of you. Daniel then said to the guard, whom the chief official has appointed over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, please test your servants for ten days. Give us nothing but vegetables to eat and water to drink. Then compare our appearance with that of the other young men who eat the royal food and treat your servants in accordance with what you see. So he agreed to this and tested them for 10 days. At the end of the 10 days, they looked healthier and better nourished than any of the other young men who ate the royal food. So the guard took away their choice food and the wine they were to drink and gave them vegetables instead. To these four young men, God gave knowledge and understanding of all kinds of literature and learning. And Daniel could understand visions and dreams of all kinds. At the end of the time set by the king to bring them into his service, the chief official presented them to Nebuchadnezzar. The king talked with them, and he found none equal to Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. So they entered the king's service. In every matter of wisdom and understanding about which the king questioned them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and enchanters in his whole kingdom. Thanks be to God. Well, good morning. Uh, we did have a, a great time in New Wine. I'm feeling spiritually up here, but physically about here. I've had two showers, slept in a clean bed, and trimmed my beard, and still uh, not quite feeling human, but we're nearly there. I also uh, lost my voice post-Lighthouse and the beginning of New Wine, so please pray that uh, my voice holds up as I talk to you, or if you want a shorter sermon, pray that it doesn't, but um, could go either way. Um, we're going to um, be looking at, as Simon mentioned, a series in Daniel on serving God, and Daniel is one of my favorite books in the Bible. The first half has all these well-known stories, and the second half has a lot of uh, prophecies that are a bit wacky and weird. But actually, some of those prophecies, knowing history of like ancient Greece and Rome, uh, proved to be very accurate prophecies indeed. And uh, 
The book of Daniel tells a story of people serving God. They're serving God under extreme pressure to conform to the uh, local culture that they have been taken to. But while they're resisting that pressure, they're willing to be used by God. They are bold and they are faithful. And there is a lot in Daniel to teach us about how we serve God in our community and in our lives today. And this morning, I'm going to be talking about uh, serving God where he's placed us, serving God where he's placed us. And actually, this is uh, something quite pertinent to me because uh, Hannah and I have, uh, in the last 12 years, lived in five different towns or cities. And within that, those five different towns or cities, we've lived in seven different houses or flats. So even if we've wanted to live in uh, live somewhere for a long time, we, we've actually not been in one location for a very long time. So this question of serving God where he's placed us has been something quite pertinent to us. But before we go any, um, any further, let's just pray for a moment. Lord, as we uh, look at Daniel, his example, and his friend's example, would you do a, a deep work in us, Lord? Would you remind us, show us how you work in us and through us, Lord? Would you open your word to us? In Jesus' name, amen. So what I want to show you this morning is how God loves you and is with you where you are. God loves you and is with you where you are. And we're going to use this first chapter of Daniel to look at uh, how we need intimacy with Jesus, uh, identity in Jesus, and increase by Jesus in our lives. So intimacy with Jesus. How did we get to this point of people being taken into exile in Daniel? Well, we see right at the beginning, God creates the world good. And he creates humanity good. He wants them for relationship with him. But they rebel and turn away from God. And God creates a people called Israel who are supposed to be a light to the nations. They're supposed to be the one people group who shows all those around what it means to follow God and to show them how good God is. But instead of fulfilling that role, they turn to the idols of the countries round about them and even create some of their own. And God warns them again and again and again and again and again and again so many times that if you are not going to fulfill the role that I have set for you, then you are going to be taken into exile. And the Babylonians are uh, a people who are the superpower of the time. They take over from uh, the Assyrians, but they conquer all the countries round about them, and they really want Egypt. Egypt is another big power at that time, and they want to conquer Egypt. So politically and geographically, they need to go through Israel. Israel becomes collateral damage in this big Babylonian war machine. But actually, God is using this. He's going to use this to restore and bring his people back to them and to fill, fulfill his purposes. And what we'll see is that God was still with Daniel and his friends and all those who went into exile. And he was also there going before them. Now, while Daniel is literally in Babylon, Babylon in Scripture is used as a metaphor for all that is against God. The cultural commentator and researcher David Kinnaman says, Babylon in scripture is a culture set against the purposes of God, a human society that glories in pride, power, prestige, and pleasure. Sound familiar at all? Right back in Genesis with Babel, with people uh, building a tower to reach God, to make themselves the highest, all the way to Revelations, where God acts in justice and rest restoration 
against all that is from Babylon. It is this metaphor for um, all that is against the purposes of God. And this is where Daniel and his friends find themselves. This is where God has led these people. And many Christian commentators today uh, suggest that the Western church is in a similar position to those in the Bible who went into exile. We're in a culture that is set against the purposes of God. So you see, Daniel and his friends needed to be strong. They needed to be close to God. They needed intimacy with God. And the Babylonian culture tried to strip that intimacy away from them. They tried to drag them away from God and all that he had for them. They, these, these friends basically go into a process of indoctrination. They go into a process of you will become Babylonian, you will be Babylonian, you will speak the language, you will do what the people do. And we see this in verses 6 to 7 in, in that first chapter of Daniel. They, these four people have their name changed. So Daniel becomes Belteshazzar. They're basically uh, changing their names from the Jewish names to the Babylonian names. And in ancient culture, names had deep significance. They, ha they described something of what you were aligned to, and they described something of your destiny. So in, in it, Daniel... Daniel has a name that links him to his God. But what they're trying to do is change his name to link him to a foreign God, a, a God of Babylon. And it's easy to get put into a box to have uh, all that is close to you and all that should be close to you moved away. I don't know if anybody's ever done uh, any of these personality tests uh, the, the Belbin or Myers-Briggs or other ones out there. Uh, I've, I've actually found them very useful um, and they help you understand something of who you are and how you fit into a team. But that's what they're important for, how you work within a team. If you just take those in isolation, you're going to kind of get this distorted view of yourself and begin to think you're this way and you can only work in this, this sort of way. And what they're doing is they're trying to take Daniel and his friends and move them away from their closeness to God and put them in a box and make them Babylonian. But you see, Daniel and his friends have intimacy with God. And if we look a little bit further into verse 11, we see that name change doesn't uh, work. Consistently through uh, this chapter and other chapters in Daniel, Daniel remains Daniel, not Belteshazzar. And his fr friends in chapter 1 re remain with the names that they are given. They find themselves in this foreign culture that is against all they believe and trying to indoctrinate them. And they have no way to go back. And they need to stay strong. And they need intimacy with God. But we know that after the exile, the Israelites came out. They rebuilt the temple. They rebuilt um, the walls of Jerusalem. And they fought off various invaders until the Romans. And at which time, Jesus, uh, sorry, God came and revealed himself in Jesus. He revealed himself as the person of Jesus who died and rose again and is in heaven and promises to be with us. Always, And this is the one that we, in our culture, in, uh, with Babylon around us, the one that we need intimacy with. Hebrews chapter 12 verse 1 says, Fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. For the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. We need to fix our eyes on Jesus. As we serve God where he's placed us, first and foremost, we need intimacy with him. We need to look up before we look around us. And we do that by uh, maintaining not just spiritual rhythms, but physical and emotional rhythms as well. 
we think about our rhythms of worship. How do we worship daily, weekly, monthly, yearly? We come together weekly to worship. Many of us have been to New Wine as a, a, almost a ritual of uh, yearly worship. What is our rhythm of prayer and scripture connecting with the author and finisher of our faith, a pioneer and perfecter? What is our, our rhythm of uh, stimulating our body and mind? How are we not just vegetating in front of Netflix or falling into that kind of scrolling pattern that sucks you in after three videos? How are we connecting emotionally with community around us and being accountable? What's our rhythm for meeting with others in the church physically? It's those rhythms of life that help us keep that intimacy with Jesus. You see, God loves you and is with you where you are, and he is desperate for us to connect with him on a deeper level. And we see that Daniel clung to his God, and he didn't give in and change his name. So for serving God where we are, we need intimacy with Jesus, but we need uh, identity in Jesus too. Now I'm, um, <clears throat> some of you will know, um, generally a very relaxed person and in fact I've been accused of being too relaxed to almost to the point of horizontal. But I'm actually quite uh, picky about certain things. One of those things is I'm very picky about coffee. Uh, I like proper coffee, I like good coffee and I only buy certain sort, sorts of coffee. I'm very picky about technology. I like to read reviews, and um, I'm generally quite an early adopter, but I want to read reviews and know what's good, and I know what I like, and that sort of thing. If it's got an apple on it, I quite like it normally. Um, I'm all, also quite picky about the, the trainers that I wear, um, which also has a downside, because it means that I take so long deciding what to buy that my other ones are really old and got holes in them as well. But, there's certain things I'm quite picky about. But we also need to be picky in our day and age about what we say yes to and what we say no to. And I think the pivotal verse in this Daniel chapter 1 is verse 8. In Daniel chapter 1 verse 8 it said, Daniel resolved not to defile himself. Daniel resolved. Um, and there's part of that. Part of the indoctrination, they were giving them food from the king's table. They were giving them something of the best food. But that food had also been offered to idols beforehand. And as part of the Jewish culture and kosher food, they couldn't eat or shouldn't have eaten anything that had been offered to idols. And this passage isn't... Um, uh, an argument for veganism and vegetarianism, although those things are good for the environment and potentially good for your health as well. But this is about Daniel and his friends being set apart for God, knowing that their identity was in God and not a uh, Babylonian identity. We need to resolve, as Daniel did, not to give in to every whim of our culture. We need cultural discernment. We need to be picky about what we do and don't do. And just like Daniel in exile, I think there are two things that are important to help us discern to know what to do and what not to do. And they are wisdom and faith. And the Bible tells us they, both of those are gifts from God. From wisdom, it says in Proverbs chapter 2, verse 6, all wisdom comes from the Lord. And, and so do common sense and understanding. And for faith, it says, for it is by grace you have, been, in Ephesians, sorry, it says, for, uh, for it is by grace that you've been saved through faith. And this is not of yourselves. It is a gift from God. We need wisdom and faith. There's the old adage that uh, it, is, uh, it is knowledge to know that a tomato is a fruit, but it takes wisdom to know not to put it into a fruit salad. 
Wisdom is knowing what to do with all that is thrown at us in our culture. We have more information and more knowledge thrown at us now than at any point in history. I read a statistic that I think is true, but it says that 90% of the world's data that exists at the moment was generated in the last two years. There's so much that is thrown at us. We need to ask God for wisdom to know how to act, what to believe, and uh, what to do. But we also need to ask God for faith. Because when, when we're asking, should I do this, should I not do that, we need to know that God is good, that he is for us. It is the enemy's old trick to suggest that God is not good, all that he has for us is not good. Is Jesus going to be with me if I decide to do this? Is Jesus going to be with me if I decide to do that? It's so great to hear those testimonies of, from Turkey of people stepping out and seeing that God is good, using that faith and wisdom in action. And you see, we're often faced with cultural messages of you do you, or we're often faced with a cultural phenomenon of chasing likes. And not everything about that is necessarily bad, but when those things come above God and all that he has for us, they become idols to us. It says in Micah chapter 6 that we should act justly and love mercy and to walk humbly with the Lord. We're supposed to seek God's kingdom first. If we're doing that, if we have intimacy with Jesus, then our identity f comes from wisdom and faith from God. You see, God loves you and he is with you where you are. So let's stay rooted in him. We see that Daniel resolved not to be defiled. He dug deeper into his faith. So then we have intimacy with Jesus identity in Jesus, and then in increase by Jesus. Verse 9, we see that God gave them favor. <clears throat> they, they acted as they were supposed to do. They did what they were supposed to do. They, they sought God first. They sought not to be compromise, but it was God who gave them favor. It was God who was going before them, such as he did for those who went on the trip to Turkey recently as well. And when we're doing those things, we often find, not every time, but we often find that God gives us favor when we are seeking to be close to him and seeking to do what is right wherever he's placed us. And we also see in verse 17 that he gave them gifts. He gave them gifts of wisdom and understanding. And he also gave them, uh, Daniel, supernatural gifts of interpreting dreams as well. But as we go out into this world, there are two dangers. As we go to where God has placed us, there's a danger that we become too separate, um, but there's also a danger that we become too synchronized to the community around us. We either look nothing like them and too foreign to them, or we look exactly like the culture. Now, I grew up in a, 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 what's called a brethren church, which at the turn of the 19th and 20th century became a movement in this country that uh, sought to bring people back to God's word, sought to highlight the importance of communion and baptism, and to highlight the importance of uh, holy living. But as time uh, moved on and the world we live in changes, that often those churches didn't change in the way that they communicated the uh, message to the point where they became a holy huddle. And often those churches would have what they call a gospel meeting, but nobody who was uh, not a Christian would come into those meetings. They were too separate from the world. They weren't able to engage and bring God's kingdom in an effective way. But also, and I think this is probably the bigger danger for us as a church is being too synchronized with the world around us. When we reflect the world, when we look exactly like the world around us, then there's nothing attractive and nothing of value to invite people to. 
I remember the time when um, on your phone you had to plug it into your laptop to, um, to, to synchronize it to your music and your photos and your apps. Now you can just do it all from your phone. But there were those days when you plugged it in and you downloaded your photos one way and you got the songs you want the other way. But there was a danger where you could uh, press a button and everything from your computer would uh, download onto your phone and your phone would be overwhelmed and there wasn't enough storage and things would crash. You also had the Android Apple problems back in those days as well. You see, we don't want to download everything from the world into our lives. We want to be set apart, be different, show God's kingdom, but we don't want to be too separate. So where has God placed us at this time? As a church, we're an Anglican church. He's placed us in a parish. He's placed us in a locality. And we're to serve those around us from our intimacy and identity with Jesus. And we do that through the noise. We do that through Alpha. We do that through um, other, other outreach uh, events, but as a resource church, we've been placed into High Wycombe, where to, where our vision is to uh, equip and reach the town and the wider area as well. And part of our vision is to do that through missional communities as well. But He's also placed us individually into different places, into work, sports clubs, social groups, schools, colleges, neighbourhoods, networks. He's given us people with different needs around us as well. How do we serve God? How do we uh, join Jesus in bringing the increase in those places? I said that Jesus is with us. As we go out, we take Jesus with us into those places. And it's him who does the work. It's him who brings the favor. It's him who gives us the gifts. He's given us the fruits of the Spirit, which are love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Couldn't remember them all off the top of my head, sorry. But he's given us those those attributes that Jesus had so we can live a life that Jesus did where he's placed us. And we saw that in verse 17, they, he, God gave Daniel and his friends those gifts to help the communities they in. But he also gave, um, he also gave uh, supernatural gifts to them. And he's, by his spirit in us, we have those who are, have gifts of healing and those who have gifts of prayer and intercession and those who have... Um, other supernatural gifts or gifts of miracles, which we shouldn't neglect in our culture that might be a bit doubtful of whether they are real or not. Often when we go, go out so as a staff team into our community, into the businesses several times a year, we ask, if God could uh, bless you, what would that be? And that opens up so many conversations to us to bring Jesus into those places. You see, God is with you. God loves you and is with you where you are. So let's sow his kingdom and his kingdom values into those places. Daniel walked the line between being too separate and too synchronized with those who are around him. So what do we how do we do this? What does it look like when we leave here now? We need to invest in where we are. For Hannah and I, when all those places we lived in, it was important for us that we invest where we were. In various places, we helped start new home groups. We got involved in a church. We made friends, even though it was painful to then leave those people behind. It's important to invest. God all throughout scripture and all throughout history places people in a place for a purpose. And he has a purpose for you and he has a purpose for me as we go out. And he calls us to invest through the intimacy with him, through the identity we have in him. And because he is already out there bringing the increase. 
And I wanted to finish with uh, a, a story. Many of you will know um, uh, Lynn Stanion, who was part of this church, and she went with the team to SMG there, and she passed away a few weeks ago from uh, a short battle with cancer. But Lynn, I believe, and I want to honor her as somebody who uh, served God where she was. She, uh, she in this church, uh, served in the children's work, and she served in small groups. She then joined the team to SMG and served in missional communities on the PCC, and again in children's work. And right up to the end, she, <coughs> excuse me, need a drink. Right up to the end, her faith was amazing. She knew who her saviour was. She knew where she was going. And that was the root uh, that, of, that was in her that meant that she was able to serve God where he had placed her. So I encourage you to invest. <coughs> know that God loves you and is with you where he has placed you. Would you please stand?